My name is Shara Donahue, and welcome to The Bible Never Said That, a podcast where we talk about popular sayings that invaded the culture and church, even though they are not theologically sound. Today we are exploring the ever-popular saying, God helps those who help themselves. Now this statement is full of rugged, independent self-reliance, but it lacks the humility to acknowledge our absolute dependence on God for every breath we draw. Jesus helped the poor and the weak. He healed those who could not heal themselves. He saves those who call on his name, knowing they cannot cleanse their own souls. Romans 5.6 reminds us that when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. So while we obey what God tells us to do, we also acknowledge that the help we get is not something we earn, but something we are given. But early on in life, we are told we should have a growth mindset, be lifelong learners, and better ourselves in mind, body, and spirit. The educator in me takes over and I start saying these things to my kids often. But we can't allow ourselves to make this mental jump that by striving, we gain blessing. It's good to want to grow, but Jesus calls us to a specific kind of growth. Does he call us to grow until we have no faults? That seems impossible this side of eternity. We ask ourselves, do we need to get everything right before we find his favor? I remember before I got baptized, I approached my pastor and said there were still some things in my life that I was dealing with, that maybe I should wait. And he wisely told me that's not what this is about. That baptism was a symbol of knowing that we couldn't find life on our own, that to be truly born again, we needed Jesus to cover us from all our sins. But what does Jesus mean when he says in Matthew 5, 48, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It is often hard to discern the difference between seeking sanctification and living under the weight of trying to be perfect. And how do we live out both Matthew 5, 48, that we just read, and Matthew 5, 3, which says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Because we serve a God who tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, 27, that he chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. In the Bible, we see this tension exemplified in the life of Saul and who he was after Christ saved him and transformed him into the Paul we know. Saul had a desire to obey the law of Moses and to prove his righteousness. He was a man who Philippians 3.5 tells us, was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Saul was also a man who persecuted the church of Christ because he believed the law demanded this obedience. Saul was a man who helped himself. It wasn't until Jesus met him on the road to Damascus that Saul began to see not only his sin in opposing God, but also that perfection and grace found in Jesus alone. In stark contrast, post-conversion Paul shows us what we should really strive for. He obeys out of love for his Savior and from the security that he has already been made righteous. In Philippians 3, 7-8, through Paul sings quite a different tune about his days of helping himself find righteousness. He says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ. We have to acknowledge that we are completely saved by faith, not works. To believe anything less is an affront to the gospel, not to mention a personal loss of knowing God's love is unconditional. 
There is this beautiful scene in the classic film Chariots of Fire, where one of the main characters, Harold Abrams, a Jewish Olympic runner, expresses his concern about winning in a conversation with a friend. Harold says, I'm forever in pursuit, and I don't even know what I'm chasing. And as he completes his monologue, he says, And now, in one hour's time, I will be out there again. I will raise my eyes and look down that corridor, four feet wide with ten lonely seconds to justify my whole existence. But will I? These are the questions that plague a humanity apart from God. I am running, but what am I chasing? Will I be able to justify my existence? If we combine the two questions, we see that in striving to justify our own existence, we will try to prove our worth to God instead of being still before Him. The only way to have a spirit of rest within us is to know that we are loved and that nothing we do or have done will change that. In her book, Finding Holy in the Suburbs, Ashley Hills reminds us, When we get sucked into busy, it's often because we're trying to do it all and be it all. The good thing about being God's child is that we have nothing to prove. Busy will never get us to be loved. In Jesus' kingdom, the way up is down. Instead of climbing ladders, let's learn how to sit, how to remain humble and ask for help from God and from others. Some of the busiest people we see in the Gospels are the Pharisees. They are so focused on earning their position in society that most of them completely mistook the Messiah for a man of blasphemy. What a tragedy to be so involved in religious activity, defending political positions, and securing a space in society that you completely mistake the one who loves you perfectly and without any pretense as an enemy? Where we place our energy and time shows a lot about the state of our souls. The ones who live knowing they are loved no matter what live in freedom that produces rest. The rest of us are chasing help, hope, and healing that we cannot find apart from Jesus. Once we have sought Jesus as our Savior from the deep sin that tries to control and destroy us, nothing that we do changes who we are as children of God. We are people who can have soul rest. Trying to earn His love is a waste of time. It's already ours. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is not us helping ourselves. This is God's rescue mission for humanity. The demands of culture and careers may try to overtake us, but Romans 8, 37 through 39 reassures us. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The great news about learning to be still before God or in anything we do is that our great and powerful, mighty God has already gone before us. Yet we are constantly called to ever-increasing holiness as well. Paul knew this, and we must learn it as well. We rest in the forgiveness available through grace, and we seek holiness. 1 Peter 1, 15-16 says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Though we are saved through faith, our works show our devotion to our God. Jim Wilkins says in her book, In His Image, Holiness permeates the entire Christian calling. It lies at the very center of the gospel. We are not merely saved from depravity. We are saved to holiness. Conversion entails consecration. So now that we understand that, how do we make a distinction between that which God has called us to as those who are to be made holy and the draining task of trying to earn love. First of all, our sanctification is about surrender and striving is about making our own way. The problem with striving for helping ourselves is most often found in the fact that people who are doing this are running after their own standards, which 
if we're honest, can shift from day to day. In comparison, the moral perfection of God reassures and promises that God acts in ways that are always consistent with his character. Humanity is too often tempted to exchange the truth of God for a lie. People who have been saved by Christ and given an identity by God are made righteous, but they don't always act that way. While the identity given by God will never change, the child of God must continue to grow towards being like their Savior. And this is what sanctification means. Simply put, sanctification means become like Jesus. Those who are seeking sanctification recognize the truth in the words of John the Baptist in John 3.30. He, Jesus, must become greater. I must become less. Yes, Jesus is humanity perfected. But he also came as the sacrificial lamb because he knew we could not close the gap between God's holiness and our lack thereof. Jesus will be the only perfect one to walk the earth till his return and the vanquishing of all evil. He is holy and humanity is not, which is why the codes of conduct developed by humans will always be faulty. But the word of God can be our guide. We count what was once our own attempts at betterment and lay them aside to become like Jesus, who prayed for those who believe in him that God would sanctify them by the truth, because his word is truth. Those seeking to be sanctified lay aside the ways they thought best and judge everything by the truth in the Bible. Another difference between sanctification and striving is that sanctification brings about wholeness. And striving? Well, striving sets the world at war. Sanctification is about God's glory, not the filthy rags we wave around when we attempt to declare glory for ourselves. I mean, look on any social media feed and you will see a fool's parade of those who have created their own definition of perfection and are affronted by those not living up to their standard. Those on the left or the right declare the sins of the opposing side, Mothers bringing up the next generation declare other mothers unfit for the way they feed, they diaper, they protect, and spend time with their children. People attack those who do things differently than their own prescribed law dictates, and then they wallow in offense. And we see this warning in James 4.1, when he asks this rhetorical question to those he's teaching, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? When the world is made up of people who strive for their own brand of perfection, the world is set up for war. Both big and small battles. Sanctification encourages us to run alongside each other, to cheer each other on, and to uplift our brothers and sisters. There is no disunity, competition, or misalignment within the Trinity. And we should hope for this unity to be present in our own lives. Hebrews 12, 14 encourages us to strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Those who help themselves and feel that they need to earn God's love put themselves in a position that pits us against one another. They act as though God's love is limited instead of unlimited. Not only does it make life feel like competition instead of something we are all in together, but it can cause us to live in ways counter to how Jesus has instructed us to interact. In the book Wild and Free by Jess Connolly and Haley Morgan, the authors point out, when we live by grace, we are grateful and gracious with others. When we're tempted to live by the law, we measure ourselves against others' value. When we are constantly measuring ourselves, we can't help but measure and critique others as well. And finally, sanctification is for God's glory. And our striving points at our own. The desire to prove our worth is an attempt at declaring our own glory. But when we allow the sweet slowness of sanctification to do its work, we glorify God. We take all of our perceived inadequacies, failings, and weaknesses to the throne of God with pleas that He would use us to glorify His name anyway. That He would let His will be done in us anyway, and make us more like Jesus anyway, though we cannot help ourselves. 
we desperately and eagerly desire his power to be made perfect in our weakness. Paul knew this desire intimately as he wrestled with the thorn in his flesh that God chose not to deliver him from. We see this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, when he says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Sometimes God allows our imperfections to linger, so that His grace can strengthen us in our tender places. But that doesn't always feel good. We don't want our imperfections there. We don't want the thorn in our flesh. But can we accept it and say, not my will, but your will, O God, so that we may know Jesus more? There is so much in life that we have no control over, so much that can weaken us. Jesus' power in our lives presents the evidence of his presence to those who still are without his forgiveness and are living under the suffocating weight of condemnation. Those who are striving for perfection but will never reach it if they stay separated from Christ. And our weaknesses help us to reach a hurting world because they see that we have something else that's helping us handle the hurt Live through the pain and have joy in the midst of trial. It's a thin line between running after holiness and sanctification and striving for a love that's already ours. But the wise Christian must decipher the difference because the difference is freedom or captivity. Believers are set apart by God and declared holy. We pursue holiness in our individual lives and don't give up. Because great is the faithfulness of God to finish the good work He began in us. The work He began is the work He will complete. He offers us His help and His strength. We must choose if we are willing to let go of our own pride and instead submit ourselves to His mercy and grace. This idea that God helps those who help themselves has stuck around because it agrees with the American ideal of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. But it's folly. This statement in its essence is justifying any good fortune we are given as at least somewhat credited to our own works. When the scriptures teach that ultimately God is most apt to help those who rely on him. And when we live knowing that God cares and loves us, even with all our imperfections and weaknesses, it is only then that we begin to understand the freedom of grace. Today we're going to finish up with a section of scripture from Philippians 1, 3 through 9. It is a prayer of thanksgiving that Paul prays for those he's interacted with. But as you listen to it, I want you to see how God completes his work and how he draws us towards holiness. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. God. Help us to stop striving and instead simply follow you. Let us see your work in our life as the grace it truly is, and not as something we earn due to good behavior. Make us holy as you are holy, and set us free from the need to justify our own existence. 
and let us know the joy that comes from knowing we are loved. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for listening today, and I hope you leave knowing you are deeply loved by a God full of grace who can make you holy. And the resources used for this episode can be found in the show notes at crosswalk.com slash podcast or on iTunes. We'd love if you would rate and review this podcast so others can find us. And until next time, may you seek the abundant life Jesus died to give and live in the truth that sets people free. 